everyone. My name is Lauren Edelstein, and I'm president of the High Tech Business Association. While some of you may not have even been born when the AOL Instant Messenger and greeting Welcome You've Got Mail debuted in 1989, I think most of us can distinctly remember our first AIM screen name, some possibly more embarrassing than others. This chat system forever changed the way people would communicate online. And AOL would continue to evolve into one of the biggest global media technology companies in the 20th and 21st century. With that, I am honored to introduce today's speaker. Tim Armstrong is chairman and CEO of AOL Inc., which is headquartered in New York City. Today, AOL serves nearly 250 million global consumers and is a leader in the digital content, video, and advertising industries. AOL owns and operates some of the largest and most influential brands and platforms on the internet, including AOL.com, AOL Mail, The Huffington Post, TechCrunch, Adapt.tv, Advertising.com, and AOL On. Under T Tim's leadership, AOL was spun out from Time Warner in 2009 to become a New York Stock Exchange listed public, public company. Prior to joining AOL, Tim served as the president of Google's America Operations and served on the company's Global Operating Committee. Prior to Google, Tim served as an executive of multiple internet and media companies. Tim serves on the board of Priceline. Tim is a graduate of Connecticut College where he served as a trustee and Lawrence Academy where he has also served as a trustee. An ardent champion of community service, Tim was honored by the Ad Council with their 60th Annual Public Service Award in 2013. Please help me in giving Tim a warm welcome along with Dean Judy Olian. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and thanks for everyone for being here. And the drill will be, as you all know, I'll ask some questions and hopefully we'll get through a lot of the content. Uh, some of you submitted questions and faculty also did and I've incorporated them into the questions. And then the microphones here will make sure that you have ample time. Well, we're really privileged to have Tim here and some AOL folks here, including some Anderson alums. Uh, and, and you really reinvented this company. And when you came in 2009, you said that AOL would be a media company powered by technology. Is that still how the way you look at it? Uh, yeah. First. Thanks for having me here, and uh, it's really nice to be in California. I left New York at, uh, got up at my house around 4 a.m. to go to the airport, and it was uh, about to snow. There's like two feet of snow, and the next thing I knew, I was on the campus here a little bit early, and I ended up walking around and doing a conference call down by the athletic field. Uh, so I, I'm pretty sure I might stay if you have room for me. <laughs> Uh, right, overall. and you had to take your jacket off, take, you yeah, were hot. Right, guys, and, yeah. right. uh, I think people knew where I was from, though, because I think I was the least tan person uh, I saw on campus. But uh, So I would say, you know, AOL's really, I, I, uh, you know, I left Google, which was a $150 billion company when I left. It was a small company when I started uh, as, as uh, part of the team there. And then when I went to AOL, AOL had been a $150 billion company and had gotten a lot smaller. Uh, overall, so it was the tale of two cities, and you know, really, the opportunity that uh, I think we saw, and I did a did a three month road show when I got to AOL, and went around and just saw almost all the everybody works there in person. And one of the things we did on that road show, and I did, is ask people, what do you think this company can be great at overall? I had some ideas, and. Uh, and the team had some ideas, the management team had ideas, and at the end of the road show, we got together in New York and I put up three uh, whiteboards. I put up a whiteboard of stuff that I thought we could do, I put up a whiteboard that the management team had voted on, and I put up a whiteboard that the entire employee base had voted on, and essentially, there were five things on each whiteboard and everything was identically the same uh, between uh, all, three, all three visions, I think, and really it was about building a media technology company, and today, you know, AOL the, was the fastest growing uh, top five internet property in the United States for consumer traffic, for multi-platform consumer traffic, uh, both all of 2014 and Q4. And, uh, you know, we have, with, we own the Huffington Post now. It's the number one distributed news site on face, news property on Facebook. And, uh, you know, today, whether it's our ad systems or the Huffington Post or TechCrunch or the other things that we do, you know, we're a leader in, in multiple spaces. And uh, we have a lot more work to do, but it, the company is a different company than it was five years ago. And it's a different company because you know, there's 5,000 people at AOL that have dedicated their lives to kind of changing the company. And I, it's, uh, 
it's worked out so far. We have a lot more work to do. So let's delve, delve um, by the way, several of our professors, including me, right for the HuffPost, so we're happy about that. Um, let's be more specific about the strategy, and you've talked about simplification and scale. You've recently had some layoffs, and I take it that that's part of your simplification strategy. So talk about that, and then we'll talk about the programmed advertising. Sure. So our, uh, you know, our marketplace and what we do as a business is, is driven by a very simple, uh, I guess, theory on where the world's going. And the theory it breaks down to the following components. One is, you know, in the, in the not too distant future, uh, a large set of uh, distribution in the United States, if you're on cable or one of the wireless companies, is, would be 100 million households. Overall, I, I think it's likely in the next three to five years that will go up to 500 million to a billion uh, as things start to come together and it'll be international, it'll be global in nature. And when things get global to that scale, the content properties and media space will have to get global uh, also. And one of the advantages we've had at AOL is we've been, you know, essentially the world's largest startup. We've, we've been able to get into spaces like the content space before it was popular again and build the Huffington Post into the largest global media news uh, source in the world at this point. And uh, I believe that that part of our strategy is about building uh, content that will scale to global extent on global networks and global platforms. Uh, and that, very few people have that right now. And I think that's a big opportunity for the future. The second one is that video, uh, as bandwidth increases and as devices get better, that you know, human beings tend to have a lot of time on their hands. You probably don't, and, and the students probably don't um, here. But you know, the, the average person actually came out of UCLA, as a matter of fact, there's a study uh, that I saw that uh, said that people will essentially be on phones for 15 hours a day uh, and, I, and outputting eight DVDs worth of data a day outbound. I from hope the phones. they were doing exercises with and their maybe phones. Doing, yeah. uh, well, but, while uh, they're, yeah. yeah. But sight, sound, and motion, I think, is clearly going to be a massive. Our, our, our mobile strategy is a video, video, video strategy. And then the last piece is the global advertising business, about a $600 billion industry. About 4% of it is mechanized with machines now. It's unlikely it'll stay at 4% for the future. So we've built one of the largest uh, machine-assisted advertising systems in the world that basically takes things from manually traded to uh, machine-assisted traded advertising, almost what happened on Wall Street. And uh, so the, the changes that you see at our business are us getting down to very big, powerful brands. It's about us getting down to very big video systems and getting down to very big uh, advertising systems. And uh, you know, I, I'd say it's the, uh, uh, it, it's the worst part of the CEO job is making those changes. I, it's, uh, it uh, feels personal. It is personal. And uh, it's tough for the company. It's tough for the people at the company. And you know, the issue for us is we have to continue to move the company forward and, and change with the industry. And if you don't change with the industry, the industry changes you. So you, know, you talk about uh, this programmed advertising, which I think now comprises about 40% of your advertising uh, revenue. And you talk about this barbell strategy, where you've got the programmed advertising, and then you've got the very intense, creative, brand-driven, customized uh, advertising, probably with a lot of uh, original content. Um, talk about the different, and, and not much in between, right. which is the old traditional model. Talk about the different cultures and talent that yeah. you need in those two parts of the barbells. And, and, and can you create synergies? Does the market understand those differences, et cetera? Yeah. So it's interesting. Our, our mission statement as a company is to simplify the internet uh, by working with the world's best builders of culture and code. And inside of our company, culture and code is the main thing that we talk about from a, uh, from a really mission, but also what we do for business. And those two things, uh, for the most part, have been polar opposites. I think I, over time, I've spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley, and uh, one of my jobs over the, the over the last 20 years has been to really introduce the media landscape into Silicon Valley, and vice versa. And um, you know, I think those are those tend to, they can be polar opposite cultures uh, overall. But what we're doing at AOL is trying to build those two cultures together because I think when you have culture and code, you know, together, it's the most powerful thing uh, in the world. And I think our barbell strategy on one side is creating the deepest, richest media experiences in the world, and at the same time, distributing them and measuring them on the most sophisticated code. 
uh, in the world. And if you go to our offices around the country, you'll go into an office and you'll have a, you know, you'll have a giant newsroom with 400 people in it with journalists. Um, but the journalists sit right next to some of the best engineers in the world. And I, I, we're one of the only places I visit a lot of companies. There's very few places where you have one of the world's best journalists sitting next to one of the world's best engineers. And the combination of those two things, you know, our, our bet in the future is going to be very powerful. So that's really. So, so that's interesting because it's still not in the same person because here we are developing MBA talent yeah. about, and I think it's the best talent in the world, which... She was uh, clear about that in a private meeting. Yes. So um, and I mean, as, as MBAs, with this uh, dual strategy, which you want to create as a hybridized yeah. strategy, I, I mean, can you find those talents in, in the same person and specifically in the MBAs? Yeah, I think it's, it's rare to find the same talent in the same person, but I'll, I'll give you one uh, you know, piece of, I guess you'd call it career advice, is if I ask people in interviews, when I interview people, uh, every single person, regardless of what job they're coming in for, I ask them to I say, there's uh, creative on one side, and there's data and process on the other side. You can't tell me you're 50-50. Which side of that curve do you fall on uh, overall? And uh, most people start out by saying they're 50-50. And I say, no, no, you can't, you know, you can't do 50-50. Um, I don't think it matters which, whether you have all the skill sets as one person or not. But I do think the biggest potential change in the future of what we're trying to hire right now are people who are OK working with the other skill set. And I, I say this constantly is, um, and, I, and I mean this from Silicon, from spending a lot of time in Silicon Valley with very well-known people, I don't know one person in Silicon Valley who is successful on their own. And I don't know one person in New York who's successful on their own. I don't know one person in business who's been successful on their own. And I, my personal belief is everybody in life is built with half the skill sets in life, and your job is to go share the other half of the skill sets you know, with the other people around you. And so. <laughs> You know, I don't even bother asking whether or not when we interview people whether they have both skill sets. It's, some people do, but it's very rare. It's more attuned, I'm looking for, whether or not people are willing to work with other people who have that skill set. I, I think the most dangerous position to be in in business today is if you bury your head in the sand and you only want to be one side or the other and you're not open to the other side. It is, you, I, I would highly suggest it's going to be career limiting if you take that attitude in the workplace. And also, I, I think that there is, you know, there is nothing more powerful than the shared success, I think, of people working together. And that working together is really what is about, um, you know, what companies are doing really well today, the most sophisticated companies. You heard those words. I didn't prime Tim about that, uh, sharing success. Of course, we're going to come back to that in terms of our key qualities here. Um, lots of, in, in what you said there, but, but I, I, I want to, um, ask about your competitor set. And there, there's been an always, I mean, there's a rumor a week on who AOL is going to acquire or be acquired by or merge with. Um, and of course, part of it is because there is this hybridization or mergers among complementary sets of, of, of core competencies in businesses that's occurring in the marketplace. So who do you view as your competitors? And in that sense, um, I'm not asking you to make an announcement here, but who right. are some natural partners? Yeah, sure. Um, you said you weren't going to be like a journalist, but you're kind of like a journalist. Um, is, uh, but of course, if you do want to make yeah, an yeah, announcement. Yeah, we make some news. Let's, let's yeah. make some news here. Yeah. Um, so I would, uh, you know, this is something I say inside the company is uh, there's 200 companies globally that want to compete in the space that are all from different industries but want to compete in the space. I think there is... Uh, seats eventually for 20 companies. And I think there's talent right now for 10 companies. So you have a industry where you have people becoming hybrid competitors with each other uh, consistently, then it's going to happen more in the future. And then the second piece is you have a set of market caps on the traditional side that probably go from 10 billion to 200 billion or 300 billion dollars. And on the other side, you have market caps that go from a billion to 700 billion. Um, and the reality is, over some period of time, I call it shooting the gap, those two things are starting to come more and more uh, together. And our strategy company has actually been to do both. This is the culture and code. Is We're trying to build a company as, as strongly as we can to shoot between that gap uh, in general. On the way going up there, 
Uh, I always I said this on our earnings call yesterday. AOL is one of the best partnership companies in the world. We have almost partnerships with all of the traditional media companies and all of the Silicon Valley companies. A lot of the Silicon Valley companies still have to just kill each other uh, overall, and a lot of the traditional media companies uh, have some partnerships. But we're one of the most partner-friendly, you know, companies. So I, you know, we already have announced a tremendous amount of partnerships. Uh, we'll probably announce more this year. I don't know, but uh, but basically the worlds are coming together. And, okay, but you still yeah. didn't answer my question. I know. Who's most like you? Who do you compete oh, with? Um, you know, I would say the competitive set we deal with is anyone trying to get time from consumers or time from advertisers. And that's that, that set, um, I would say, three or four years ago was just the internet companies. And I'd say now that we're starting to partner with a lot of traditional media companies, uh, and I'm not dodging your question, but I, we don't r truly talk about the competitive set internally. What we talk about is, how do we build stuff ourselves or partner with people to get more mind share, either from consumers or from advertisers? And you know, we're, we're not out specifically attacking other companies or other strategies. And as a matter of fact, our strategy, we, we had a proxy battle. We, we, I mentioned this to you before. But you know, our strategy was so differentiated at the time we did it. We bought the Huffington Post. We bought video companies. We got into video and content before a lot of people knew video content might be big on the internet. And we got attacked because investors thought it was not the right strategy and we were wasting our money uh, overall. So we've taken that, that tack strategically, which is let's go out to where nobody is and invest behind that. Um, so we have competitors. It's anyone trying to get time, but we don't really spend a lot of time strategically focused on that. We spend time focused on where we're going. I, I'd say in the ads business, Facebook and Google are, are competitors with us. We're also partners with both of them. And on the content side, it's anybody who's delivering news and services to consumers. Um, and, and that brings up the question about content discovery. Um, and, and both of those have social platforms. Right. And, and in a sense, you don't. And today, a lot of content discovery is through social platforms. Right. So how will you make up that gap yeah. when, when you don't so, really uh, have that social yeah, platform? What, one, of the, one of our professors pointed that out. Yeah, so uh, I think from a social standpoint, we've, uh, we've taken a, uh, if social is the razor, we've taken a razor blade approach, which is we're going to put all of our services at the end of every social network. So when you look at, uh, you know, we, I think this is maybe the third or fourth month in a row, we've got rated as the number one distributor of content on Facebook. Uh, and uh, we're a big distributor on Twitter, big distributor across other areas. We're getting into Pinterest now. So I think the question is whether or not you're a social network or you are a partner with the social network and you have a business model around that. I'd say we're much more on the partner, uh, the route there. And then the, the second piece is we have a whole bunch of stuff we're doing in social that we're testing ourselves and building ourselves. But I, I think we have a universal joint strategy, which is I don't care if you're on Google, I don't care if you're on Twitter, I don't care if you're on Facebook. Uh, you know, our, our strategy is to basically to be a partner and a monetization partner regardless of what platform you're on uh, overall. I, I do think there's a couple lessons in here for AOL. AOL at one point had the largest social uh, distribution in the world with AIM, which Lauren I think mentioned. Uh, and AOL lost it because they didn't understand it. And uh, you know, the, the, the first week I was at the company, uh, the f one of the first charts I saw was AIM. Uh, AIM had already come down from about 80 million users down to 20 million users. And the week before I started, they lost 7 million users in one week. Uh, and if you're an internet company, 7 million, the cost of getting 7 million users is absolutely exponential. And when I went to find out why we lost the 7 million users, we had essentially plugged into another social network and just sent those users off to another social network. So this goes back to talent uh, also is in the space we're in today, you have to understand how the industry works. You have to understand how the platforms work. Your business models have to do that. And I think our strategy in social is to basically have a sophisticated set of people that understand where social is going. Because social is going to continue to change. Uh, how does our business model fit into social rather than us trying to be a social network company? I think that would be a flawed strategy for us at this point. It's better for us to have a model that works on social. So, so you're known for your ad tech competencies, I mean, perhaps better than anyone. Um, is, is there a point that that sophistication is going to backfire and where the consumer is going to say, enough, I'm turning you off. I don't want you to know as much about me. I think there's a, um, 
at me. Or I don't want you to use what you know about me back at me. Uh, I think the value exchange on consumers with their data over time will change. And uh, I, I have a longer term theory, it won't be short term, but a long term theory I call the reverse economy which is a lot of the stuff that happens today in the world is businesses get massive amounts of benefits from consumers. Uh, even in the offline world, you have to get in your car and drive to a, a retail location. You have to walk around the store, find your stuff. If you add up all the time, energy that you put into going to another corporation as a consumer to get all that stuff, you know, my guess is over time that will go in reverse. And I think data uh, you know, may go in reverse eventually also. We're probably not there now. But the, the question is for you as a consumer, how do you get benefit from your data? And right now the internet works that you get better services, more targeted, all that stuff for giving your data up uh, for, for those things. And over time is the question is, does data become so valuable that you're able to control it as a consumer and get more valuable out of it and kind of reverse the flow of where value goes you know, with your data? And I, I think the current data structure on the internet today I, it's, I think it's likely not to last uh, forever because I think people will innovate over time once data becomes more and more valuable to understand how consumers can capture some of that value themselves. Yeah. What I, do you I, think? Are you? Well, I, I think we're closer to that point, yeah. that tipping point than, than what you're implying. Yeah. Especially with all of the cybersecurity violations that are occurring. Yeah. People are going to become much more protective. So in, in, uh, in your school, here, if we were to poll everybody here. We can poll. We can poll is, uh, do you feel like you're concerned about your data now? Uh, you want to have a different data structure of how you're doing things, or you just enjoy your services so much that you're not really concerned? Well, how many people get up this morning and said, I'm really concerned about my data, and I'm going to spend 15 minutes thinking about my data this morning? That's an unfair. One person did. Th this, is go did. this is leading. You need to hire them. him immediately. <laughs> This is leading the witness, Tim. What? I'm sorry. This was leading <laughs> the witness. Yeah. That's not cool. That's not cool. What are you studying? At your uh, high tech business. Are you? So what do you? Uh, why did you get up this morning and think about it? Oh, are you thinking about doing a business around it, or? No, I just there's a lot I do online, and you know, what is what am I going to be doing with that, and or what can companies do with that tomorrow, and what can they do with that in five years? Yeah, and these are millennials, and we, we know that millennials are exhibitionists in terms of their data. <laughs> so this is not a fair test. Um, okay, so, so everything that you're doing depends on data analytics skills. And by the way, this is another plug for Anderson. We're developing, thanks to Professor Sanjog Bisra, a degree in a master's in data analytics because we have um, a great faculty. So. How important is that for your business, and what do you look for in terms of that skill set? Um, well, one is we look for people who aren't fearful of data. Uh, and I think that, you know, you, from the generation that's here, and if you're in school here, you're probably not fearful of, you know, data. But I feel, you know, many people in the world having to deal with data every day is new in the business landscape uh, overall. But I think what we're trying to do is find people who are, if they're not data centric themselves, they're okay enabling data to help make better decisions. Uh, and you know, this, you know, I, I spend my time halfway from my career, halfway in New York and halfway in Silicon Valley. When you go to Silicon Valley, a lot of things just get taken for granted. Like you're gonna use data making decisions. You know, when you go into a lot of the creative communities, you know, they don't use a lot of data uh, making decisions, but where creative communities are going in the future, you're gonna want to use data because the scale of creative is gonna have to go up with the scale of uh, you know, technology. So I, I I guess the minimum threshold is we try not to hire people that are fearful of data. And the ideal threshold is we hire people that are proactively data enabling all the decision making they're making, even if they're not in the data business. Uh, and I, you know, there's simple examples of this, but if you take data around hiring, for instance, many HR departments and many recruiting departments aren't used to using a massive amount of data to help them figure out how to recruit uh, better in general. Like, I don't, I'm wondering at our company or other companies if I tried to compare the students coming out of your program versus other programs, how successful were they at AOL, you know, how successful were they in industry, how long did they stay for, all those things, a whole bunch of data that would help us determine whether or not this is the number one school we should be at, you know, recruiting wise, and I know you'd say it is. We're the uh, best. The best. Uh, but, uh, but those are the types of things I think in business, you know, 
in five years or ten years, that, that's gonna, every company is going to be doing that uh, overall. And I, I think that's truly, uh, it's truly important skill set. So, so let's, uh, <coughs> l let me ask one more question of, uh, about um, the kinds of people you hire, and then we'll talk about leadership. Y you know, you're a technology company, you're a data analytic company, you um, are uh, an innovation-oriented company, and you want people who are innovation-oriented. You have huge projects, and you want people with managerial and project management skills. You want people who understand the content landscape. So if you're giving advice to the MBA sitting here, where would you tell them that their best advantage is in terms of getting positions and opportunities at AOL-like companies? Yeah, I, I, first of all, I think, um, let me just take it right to the street level. I think, I think getting a job at some of the companies you may want to go work at, you can easily stand out, and I say this to candidates a lot, um, by upfront, everybody sends resumes or LinkedIn profiles that look exactly the same, okay? My guess is you probably have unique skill sets and things that you could, if you just do a minutia amount of work before you go visit a company and send a document along that has some data analytics behind why you think you're the right candidate based on what you saw from our company profile, all those things in general, I could almost guarantee you'd get an interview at every single job position at our company if you just didn't send a resume or LinkedIn profile uh, to the company, but you put a little bit of work in it. And I think that is, uh, that tough, that stuff doesn't even get to the recruiters to get you in the job. When people do that, it gets to my office. Like I, every about three or four times a year, I get something from the recruitment team or from one of the managers that says, you're not going to believe what this candidate did. And, I, and you know, the skill set we, we most look for is really creativity. You want people who want to come in and create things and build things and do things. So I think that's just one. I think the second thing is, you know, I, I'm guessing coming out of this program, you're uh, highly attuned uh, in terms of where the world's going, and you probably use technology a lot and those things. But almost every company needs the skill set that's coming out of here. But the second piece of skill set we want is can you work on a team? Uh, so the ideal person, if you came up to me, I'd want to know, are you uh, data enabled? Are you team enabled? Uh, are, you, uh, are you curious about what the things are that we're doing that you have passion around and putting those things uh, together? I was actually reading Lauren's background before uh, she did the introduction on the way out here, on uh, flying out here this morning. And uh, I think like Lauren's, I don't mean to embarrass you, Lauren, but you know, Lauren's uh, background is basically, uh, uh, she's going to work at eBay. Is it okay if I say all this stuff? Yeah, You're going to work at eBay, which I thought was interesting. But more importantly is doing the, the business club uh, stuff, but also you're doing sports uh, marketing stuff, right, uh, overall. So if you look at Lauren's resume, and it wasn't your resume, it was bio, but when I looked at Lauren's resume coming out here, I thought this is exactly the type of person we would hire at uh, AOL. The person is uh, leadership oriented, uh, involved in uh, doing things uh, both in the community and at school, and also has a specific viewpoint on what she wants to do from a business standpoint uh, overall. So if, if Lauren had given me her bio when I came in here, I'd say, why don't you come in for an interview? And I did, eBay got you first. But uh, you know, those are the type of things that I think we look for in, uh, in candidates. I, we're not looking for average uh, candidates, average resumes, average experiences. We're looking for people who are exceptional. Our uh, assistant dean for career services is here, and we're listening intently. There you Reggie, go. Reggie is up there. Yeah. So, do you? Uh, what, what's the pitch on this program when you talk to uh, talk to companies? I don't mean to put you on the spot. Afterwards. Right. Changes, right? But you put this home and teach the students on things and of course, the people who are admitted to UCLA Anderson have a very interesting sense of purpose right. and profile that represents our values, which we'll talk about in a moment. Okay, I want to talk about leadership. And, and you came in 2009. AOL was, could I say, in a tailspin. Um, you, were, you came from Google. But you came and you were thrust into an incredibly visible role. Uh, every pronouncement that you made made headlines. What have you learned about leadership uh, in the last six years, is it? 
succeed? Yeah. Um, first, I think the first thing I learned about leadership, I, I work for exceptional leaders, you know, across my uh, career, and, and I think that, uh, you know, one of my personal things has been to always have an entourage around me. So I have some of the speakers that have actually been here, you know, are, are people I would consider to be uh, mentors of mine. So Jim Stengel, who some of you know is one of our professors, yeah. is on Tim's board. So Jim, I was very close with Jim when I was at Google, and Jim really helped re-engineer how Google actually did its business uh, side. I've always spent a lot of time at Procter & Gamble. And there's people like Howard Schultz, Ken Chenault, uh, those type of people that you know, I spent time with over time, Mickey Drexler from J. Crew. And I think the biggest lesson I learned on leadership uh, you know, overall from people, Rick, Rick Scott, who was the governor of Florida, I worked for, uh, for a while. Uh, you know, th these people are exceptional people because they're, um, they're long-term oriented and they are okay taking risks and chances. Um, but they're excellent with people. I mean, I think all of the, all of the people that have been here and, the, and Jim Stangle, and they're just exceptional uh, people and they're good leaders. And I think the, the lesson, at, uh, lesson at AOL has really, uh, leadership-wise, been around uh, really setting a clear vision, really setting a clear strategy. And there's been lots of bumps in the road uh, in the AOL journey uh, for me as personally, professionally, uh, on the leadership front. But you know, one trait that I think really uh, great leaders have and something that I would aspire to be is they have a lot of fortitude. I, I don't know any leaders who haven't gone, even if you're at the most successful company in the planet, who haven't gone through massive amounts of uh, change. And I think if you want to lead in today's environment, if you're not okay with change, uh, don't sign up for leadership uh, because change is something that is a competitive advantage uh, right now in, in all industries, I think. And I think leadership comes down to that. And I think the second thing is, you know, you have to be authentic. I think people know who you are. Uh, you know, I think the world's become more and more transparent. So I think uh, the authentic, authentic side of leadership is, uh, you know, is important. And then the last thing uh, is I, I think really, 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 uh, very good leaders surround themselves with really, 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 really good people. And you know that's such a, uh, I think people talk about that all the time, but, the, but if you don't want, if you want to be a big time leader, you have to have big time uh, people around you overall. And if you, uh, we were just up in your office and I saw the John Wooden uh, picture and it was, it was a huge uh, inspiration to me. You know, if you look at John Wooden's basketball teams, he had the best players in the world, uh, you know, on his team. And I think that's the mentality you have to have is you, if you don't want to work with the most talented people in the world, you're going to have a hard time leading. And you have to be okay with it. People who are really talented are really challenging. Uh, and what do you know today that you learned that you didn't know then in 2009? In 2009, um, you know, I, I think that uh, we, we had our earnings call yesterday and I announced the fact that for 2015 we were basically moving a lot of the profits that we would normally get out of 2015 back in the company and investing. And, you know, our stock got hit, went down 10% yesterday and, you know, every major publication in the world wrote something about us and wrote something about me. And, you know, I think five years ago I, I I probably would have cared, uh, and I don't mean I don't I don't I don't care about that, but I realized that one day uh, we made the right decision for the company, we made the right decision for our consumers and customers, and the only thing I should care about the first thing I did after the earnings call yesterday was I went right up to the head of operations who's working on a major transformation inside the company, and I spent my time focused on what's the next thing we need to get done to move the you know, company forward. And I think that when I first got to AOL, when you're in that type of position, you know, you're not used to having the world comment on uh, everything you do. But the reality is as long as you're doing the right thing for consumers and customers, that's what you should pay attention to. And uh, one of my mentors sent me a note last night basically saying, saw what you did today, uh, you know, very successful CEO. He said, exactly the right thing to do. I, I hope you didn't read anything today or pay attention to anything. Show up tomorrow morning and keep going. And that's, that's really what I think I've learned. Well, and it means a lot that you showed up here. In the, no, I mean, in the midst of in the midst of what you're going through. No, yeah. I, I mean, but but you know, it's funny actually. It's uh, I, you know I can imagine from the outside if you read the press headlines like yesterday, you say, oh my God, I, you know he's uh, the AOL's all over the press again, and you know they went down 10 percent yesterday, and. You know, for me to come here, this is exactly what my job is. My job is, and I'm going to uh, visit one of your, with one of your professors after this, and I'm going to see the CEO of another company after this. Th this is my job, and this is what we do as a business. And, uh, you know, yesterday's one day in a long history for AOL, 30-year history for AOL. It's probably not going to matter in the long term. Um, 
you have the distinction as a leader of being somebody who reinvented a company. Um, and, and you went from a very traditional subscriber-based internet model to a company that's now leading the future of advertising and the model of content with advertising. Could you have done this if you had come from within? Was it important that you came in from the outside I with that it, vision? Uh, I think it's sometimes it's helpful to come in from the outside. Uh, you know, the, the issue when you're inside an organization is it's hard to wake up. I mean, Jack Welch has a uh, you know, famous saying that every time he flew back to the headquarters that when he landed, he would fire himself and say, if somebody was taking over for me, what's the five things they would go in and fix that day? And then he'd go in and fix them. And, uh, you know, I think that is the mentality you have to take. Like, every single year I write down a set of goals. Uh, but also I have this thing I call thinking time where every single week I take time to just think about one thing we need to change as a company, like really deeply uh, think about it. And that model of reinventing from the inside out, if you're somebody who's been someplace for a long time, it can be tough to reinvent because you get to be like a frog boiling in water if you're not careful. But I think if you take that Jack Welch mentality, um, if you're an insider, you actually know how things work. So you can actually be more disruptive. But you have to be, to be disruptive, you, you really need to decide you're going to be disruptive. And it, it was easier for me probably at AOL to come from the outside to be disruptive because it was a change point for both the people at AOL and for me. I think internally, it, it takes more effort to be a change agent internally. And I, I find this with myself also now. You have to actually take a real step back. And, and, and what are those personal costs to reinvention, and there are some. I mean, you yes. have to shatter businesses, yeah. some of which were your babies. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, you know, a huge business that we only own half of now, which is Patch, which I still think is a huge need in the United States, which was putting local media properties in every community in the United States. You know, that, that, that was uh, seen as my baby. It was a huge investment. Uh, it was, you know, it got a lot of press. And uh, I think the reality is, though, if you're not willing to take risks, I, I just sent a note to our executives this morning after uh, yesterday saying, look, the bottom line is, you know, we should take more risks today than we took yesterday. Like, you know, now's our time to continue to move. We just told the world we're going to invest in the company instead of sending all the profits back, you know, or, or keeping the cash. So don't, yesterday was a huge risk we took as a company. Don't waste today. Show up and start changing things and growing. And I think that the personal side of it is, you know, I, I think if, if you sometimes don't go through pain, you don't change. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that, uh, I did recently an outside person do a 360. And you know, at the end of the day, you know what the things are you need to work on and what are the things are. But actually getting that direct feedback is something you have to go through on a regular basis. And, uh, and I think if you're not willing to change as a leader, your organization's probably not going to be willing to you know, change. And change can be exhausting, but I think change is a, is a fundamental you know, thing that's happening in the world today. I think there's, I call it the thread being pulled, but so many things are collapsing at this point that you have to be willing to change. Uh, and I'll take maybe two more minutes, and then we're going to go to you and your questions if you can get ready. Um, how, how do you decide where to pass your priorities? I mean, you have the business to run. You have the board. You sometimes have activist investors. You've had them. You have community interests. You have your family. Um, how do you manage that mindset? You know, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about that and talking to other people about it. And uh, I started with two things. I started with a personal mission statement of basically how do I, I want to live my life. Regardless of all those other things, what are the things that, what are the values I care about? And uh, I wrote those down. I live by them. I have them posted up at home in my closet. So every morning I get ready, they're, they're right there. And the, the second thing after that is family. And I think that, uh, you know, I, someone said this to me a long time ago. I think it's true is that, you know, there's two things. You're only as happy as your as your least happy child, and uh, you're only uh, your any business success you have will be dwarfed by any non-success you have on the home front. And I, I think those two things are things that I start with uh, after that. And then I think my responsibility. I, I feel a huge amount of responsibility to the company and the families uh, at the company. So I every uh, the way I feel about my family is the way everybody feels about their family at work and what they do for their livelihood. And so I, I think those are the two guiding top-level things I worry about uh, overall. And then after that, um, 
You know, I really, really focus on trying to make the right decisions and having good judgment and making sure the people around me have good judgment uh, also. And, and uh, you know, I, I really believe in the notion of stretching ideas and getting the smartest people in the room that, uh, you know, when I, when I was growing up, the, the notion of a CEO was always this powerful figure who knew everything, who dictated things down to the organization. And when you get to be a CEO, you realize that the only way a company is going to be successful is if you have really good people at the company and really good judgment about what to do overall, and you don't get bl you don't blindside yourself by your own limitations. And uh, uh, I have lots to say on that, but that, that 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 those are the things that I think about. And and lastly, you've actually placed you personally and and AOL placed. A big priority in developing women. You've got BBG Ventures, which is run by Susan Lyons, investing in women-run enterprises, startups, Makers.com, uh, women, oh, girls who code. Why? What is it that you see in that priority? Not that that I question it, but yeah. Um, but, but I, I think why um, focus on you that? know I think it's probably a, a collage of things in general. But I, I grew up in a household where my mom's been working at the same company for 30 years, and uh, I saw how hard she's worked. She went from a secretary to running uh, the HR group at uh, the company she's at, and I think that was an inspiration to me to watch her go through that transformation growing up. And uh, but as I got into business, what I realized is. The, the first project that we invested in for women's leadership is called makers.com. It's the largest set of uh, HD uh, videos. We have 270 of them now. There's 3,000 HD videos. We do PBS documentaries on women's leadership. And the, the woman who was, who was trying to found that came over to our house for dinner. And my wife had gone to a, a meeting with Gloria Steinem to try to find people to fund this project. My wife came home and said, you're always talking about women's leadership and how the internet needs more women building things. I saw this project. Why don't we have the founder over for dinner? So the founder, Dylan McGee, came to our house for dinner. And two minutes into hearing the project, she said, this has been going on for seven years. It can't get funded. And I said, on the spot, I said, I'll write a check personally for it. If, if, uh, if AOL doesn't want to do it, I'll fund it you know, myself personally. And I went to the company, met with the executive, said, guys, let's build the largest example of women's leadership stories in the world. And uh, let's back this, this woman. And a woman named Maureen Sullivan uh, internally worked with me at Google, who's at AOL now, came and basically built this property. And we just we launched in the US. We did a PBS mini series on our uh, documentary. We just launched in China this past year. And I think there's two reasons for it. One is there's a, the, the, the internet has not been built for the customers who use it uh, overall. And I think women building more parts of the internet and mobile and those things will be really important. So it helps us as a company sort of lean into that uh, area overall. And then the second piece is. So, so there's a business imperative. Here. I think there's a real business opportunity there uh, overall. And the, the second thing is, you know, I have two daughters. I have three kids. I have a son and, and, uh, and two daughters. And, you know, after you have kids, I think your perspective changes. It, it changes a lot, and it's it's uh, it, it is unbelievable to me uh, that if you're a woman, uh, you have a different opportunity set than a man does uh, going to work. And I would never want that for my daughter, my two daughters, and my son. I want them to all have equal footing for their skill sets, whatever skill set you have in life, to maximize that. And you know, after getting involved in makers, I've spent a lot of time with the different makers, uh, women, and and traveling around. Uh, I've been amazed at the stories about uh, you know the limitation effect, and I think the limitation effect can go away if there's more education pushed out into the world. I can talk about this for a long time, but th there's uh, if half the population in the world, more than half the population in the world, uh, doesn't have the same opportunity set, you can imagine how limiting that's going to be. And if you can educate people on why that's not the right way to do it, and we can do it with our distribution and our power, you know, invest in it, I think it's a very good business decision. I also just think it's an awesome decision for our company. Questions? Go ahead. You've got the microphone. And just introduce yourself, if you don't mind. Yeah, my name is Brian. I am a 2012 alum. Uh, I worked with these esteemed salespeople. They were always fantastic. Uh, and a uh, question for you, one of, our, one of our strategy classes here, we talk about the TiVo case where they created a lot of value, but they didn't capture a lot of value. And they created the DVR, but then they captured an infinitesimal portion of that. What is the real value you think that AOL is creating, and what hinders you from capturing all that value? Yeah, uh, I think it's a really good question. Uh, uh, 
basically the, the value we're creating as a business is building capabilities that are going to be really important in the future. And I think that the, you know, in my estimation, the company's undervalued uh, for what we're able to do right now in the marketplace. Uh, but we, we have to uh, operationalize that to the point where, I mean, I'm a, I'm a free cash flow investor, is show me the cash uh, on the way out. And I think that that's something we're working towards very diligently right now. I think the second piece is some of the strategy stuff we've did, like when we invested in content and Huffington Post and the ad systems and those things was well before the market. So some of the investments we're doing probably won't be captured for like, you know, a couple of years, but that's okay. I think when we capture them, they could be pretty substantial. Uh, overall, and I think as a you know as a leader and as a company, you have to manage how much you're trying to capture today versus capturing the future. And the reaction we had yesterday from Wall Street was really about us standing up and saying we actually think what we're going to capture this year, we're going to delay a year or two and invest you know more in it. And uh, our job is to make sure that happens uh, overall. So. Uh, you know, I think there's there's time periods where companies are undervalued because their strategy is probably further out than the operational nature of what they're doing. I think that's been the case with us, and you know, and will be, and that's what we announced uh, yesterday. But I think it's also absolutely the right thing to do. If you ask me, if I think AOL's gotten less or more valuable the day before earnings versus the day after, I think we've got more valuable. But uh, you know, Wall Street short term may disagree with it, but I think long term, hopefully, we'll capture that. Questions. Don't be shy. Go ahead. Good morning. My name is David Devan. I actually uh, was just accepted and plan to start in the fall, so not even a student. There you go. But uh, um, my question is regarding the data sharing, as your kind of unscientific poll indicated. Most people really don't care about sharing information. There most are negative effects to most that. Most millennials. Sorry. Most millennials. Most millennials, yes, are uh, our demographic. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some negative effects to that. As we know, everything goes in cycles. What do you think kind of the events that will lead up to the end of everyone wanting to share their information and data analytics, et cetera? What do you see for the future of it? Yeah, you know, I think uh, there's two viewpoints on that. One would be really negative. There's some, there's an event that happens that, uh, you know, where you don't, you, something, you know, something bad happens and someone's data led directly to, uh, you know, that happening or a group of people's uh, happening. And I think that's a danger point the world lives with, you know, today uh, overall. I think the Sony case, you know, here very germane to, uh, AO, uh, to uh, LA, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that that company almost got destroyed from the inside out uh, there. So I think it's a, I think there's some case points now that would lead you to believe that, you know, there's danger uh, in general and people are really focused on it. I think the other piece, though, is, you know, the question is, uh, is there a way on the protect protection side and on the benefit side that it's going to be uh, too, too much of a benefit over time and the protections will have to get built around it so it becomes, uh, you know, uh, a huge benefit. I think today it's a big benefit. Uh, I do think when we look backwards 50 years from now, uh, you know, there'll be, more, there'll be more safeguards built and more things uh, so data is uh, protected. So, you know, uh, God forbid anything really, you know, bad happens, and I think bad things do happen with data today. But um, I think there's enough attention on it now uh, that people are starting to get really serious about it. Both consumers are getting more serious about it, and uh, and you know, people. I, I'd also say even millennials. I, I've seen a change in millennials. Like when I, when the when Facebook first came out, and I was working, and people were hiring, and our recruiters would go to Facebook. You know, when I was at Google to look at people's profiles. You know, people have gotten a little bit more reasonable, the millennials, about what data I think they put online. And a group, uh, I took a group of 12 people we had hired out to dinner maybe a year ago, and I asked them what their data thing was. And a lot of them said, look, when I'm dating people now, I use LinkedIn. Like, I put my real persona on LinkedIn. And, you know, when I want somebody to know who I am, I send them over to LinkedIn, and then I have all the kind of social stuff I do. But they were, they seem to be more getting to who I really am as a person versus all the you know insanity that was that had started on socials and now is that true or false I don't know that that's what they said do you guys use LinkedIn differently than you use so is it would I, would I think you're a different person on LinkedIn versus social yes yes so uh, so anyways I, I hopefully nothing bad happens but I think it's uh, the security stuff is really serious and uh, you know Good. important thank you Hello, uh, thank you for coming here. My name is Amir Ali Ghassamipour, and uh, I was wondering, a, you a, mentioned, a, excuse me? And are you an MBA? Yes, a FEMBA. 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 
Okay. Sante. Fully employed, part time. Oh. Yes. Thank you uh, for coming in, at your lunch. Of course. Time. Thank you both. Uh, so um, my question was that you mentioned you don't uh, really care so much about the publicity in the press or you know what they write about you or how the stock reacts uh, as a result of your internal decisions. Uh, if that's the case, how do you? Uh, what's your strategy in communicating directly with your uh, consumers and your customers? Uh, what language do you employ if if you right. if you don't really care? So All right, much that's good. I, I shouldn't say I care about the. Uh, company reputation, I care about our press around the company and those things in general. I just, I try not to make decisions uh, based on what the reaction is from the press on things. But, um, you know, really I think what we're trying to communicate when we talk to people about what's happening at the company or consumers or employees or anything is to be, uh, is to be really direct. I think that, uh, you know, our, our brand strategy is around explaining what you talked about, which is, you know, we're a content company, we're a media company now, we do the following things for people. And then what I'm really trying to do with the, the corporate AOL Incorporated is make AOL Incorporated less of a public uh, facing item and have our brand stand up. Like if I had a choice between having what AOL Incorporated did for earnings yesterday be the front page story or what the Huffington Post is doing or our ad systems group are doing, those things, I would much rather have those you know, be the front facing story. So, you know, we're very attuned to what happens with our reputation in the press, all those things in general. But um, my lesson, I guess, to explain it more clearly has been, you know, to not overreact uh, to those things as well. And if, if we stay true to what our long term mission is, eventually that stuff over time, the noise starts to collect in the right direction uh, there. And I would say strategy wise inside the company, what we do is we try to be pretty active with social media, active with the press themselves, and try to get what we believe is the right stories out. And if we make mistakes, be honest about making mistakes. Um, I don't know if that's what your question is, but that's. Yeah. I think you uh, answered my question perfectly because I was curious about whether the AOL brand is, uh, is a priority to your company or the sub. Uh, Sort of uh, uh, sub brands like Huffington Post and yeah. What so the AOL it. core, you know, the AOL core brand is still a massive brand. There's tens of millions of people who use it. It does uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue and profits uh, overall. And you know, for for the world, uh, you know, if uh, AOL the brand is something that the whole world knew. AOL spent 22 billion dollars on marketing before I started. So I don't go anywhere in the world where people don't know what AOL is uh, overall. And the biggest question I get sometimes now is, what is what does AOL do? You know, what do you? I know it does email and it has a homepage and stuff. But what the, I hear all this other noise about it. So what we're essentially trying to do is rebuild the AOL brand so it means something. It means really curating information, you know, for people. And then really step up the other brands in the portfolio. And one of the things I spend a lot of time with Jim Stangle on is discussing this because he's one of the best branding people uh, in the world. And uh, you know, I, I think in the future, if you go 10 years from now, hopefully the AOL core brand, the consumer brand, will be you know rebuilt, and you'll know it, and hopefully you'll use it. But you'll probably know us as a whole series of brands, almost more like a Procter and Gamble. Uh, is overall, but uh, we have a little bit of the Coca-Cola problem, which is the name of the company is the same thing as one of our big uh, consumer brands, and that's something that uh, we're continuing to parse apart a little bit. Thank you for that. Thank you. Any anyone else? Yeah, you'll be the last question, and I'll close with another question. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Buzz Black. I'm a uh, graduating uh, full-time MBA this June. Um, a lot of people here are in the you know marketing analytics data realm. I'm actually in the finance realm. And I know that a lot of my colleagues here are going to be entering investment banking, and I just wanted to ask you. You know, we don't have a lot of opportunities to be in the same room with the CEO of a public, publicly traded company. So I just wanted to ask you, what do you value in your relationships with your financial advisors? Your your bankers, um, I know that you know, AOL has been a fairly acquisitive company and you've had a lot of transactions that you've undergone and you've probably had a lot of interactions with them. I think a lot of us would benefit just kind of understanding from a CEO's perspective, what have you valued in your relationship with uh, you know, the financial professionals that you've worked with? And, and what, what aspect of finance are you going into? I'm going to be in investment banking and technology, actually. So. Right. Uh, so it's interesting. I think that, uh, you know, one of the huge benefits we've had as an organization is being partners with some of the great investment banks. And I, I, there's, there's uh, two banks that we've spent a lot of time with. One is Allen and & Company, uh, Nancy Peretzman, who I think is one of the best bankers in the world and somebody I talk to a lot. I think she's got one of the best judgments in the world. She's a very, very attuned person to uh, the judgments on whether things are going to work or not. And I talk to her all the time. 
Uh, the second one is we've done a lot of work with Goldman Sachs over time, and, and Anthony Noto, who's now the CFO at Twitter, was really our main uh, uh, contact there. And he's a very talented, per incredibly talented person also. And I go, I go back to the whether or not you can sort of uh, the share success you know, motto is uh, my job at the company is to put the absolute sharpest people I can around the company with us to help us uh, succeed. And going back to the kind of entourage, I, I, not knowing people who are successful just on their own, I think the investment banks that we've worked with over time, those are two, two of the ones we work with. We worked with other ones, uh, Roger Altman and other people as well. But, uh, you know, the, the real success we get from the investment bankers is getting a third party outside viewpoint either on our own company or what's happening in the landscape. And the other thing I would just say, you know, for you specifically, if you're going to go into this field, the most helpful thing when you're a CEO is you need to know all the data. Uh, and a lot of times, depending on what, who you're dealing with or where you're going, you're getting shades of different viewpoints depending on what people want you to do. And I think one of the things that great investment bankers do is they bring a open playing field, all the data, and they're really honest. Uh, and I think if you go through you know, the history of a lot of the deals that have happened in the world and a lot of the things that have come together, you know, I just was reading about one of the deals that happened yesterday you know, uh, from one of the investment bankers I know in Silicon Valley is, is uh, you know, the, the bankers play a very, very critical role when they're a trusted judgment advisor and they're not in sales. They're not trying to sell you something or get you to sell something where they're actually coming in and having a long-term relationship and they're honest, direct, and full of data. And, uh, you know, the companies that do that well are absolutely essential to us and exceptional uh, and have helped AOL get to where it is. We, we, AOL's done some very complicated transactions and without those people, I don't think we would have been able to do them properly. Uh, interesting. So two uh, quick questions. Uh, you, you're kind of a, a maverick in locating in New York as your headquarters. You're building up here in uh, Silicon Beach. Yep. Uh, how come you're in New York? You know, I, I think, uh, you know, New York is a completely differentiated environment for us to be in. And I think when I got to the company, people would say, oh, you know, pick the headquarters up and move it to Silicon Valley. And I think, you know, if you do what everybody else does, you end up what everybody else uh, ends up with. And I think a uh, AOL being in New York for us, you know, it's the, probably the most diverse talent base uh, in the world is in New York uh, overall, one, one of the most diverse talent bases. And I think over a long period of time, what we're trying to do is build the largest internet company headquartered in one of the most important cities in the world with the most diverse talent in the world. If you walk into our office in New York City, it's three floors, it's about 1,200 people, you know, you will see a range of uh, everything you can imagine uh, inside of our building. And it looks a little bit like New York City does. And over time, if we build our products and services to look like our workforce um, here in LA or in, in Santa Monica and you know Silicon Valley and London and uh, Tokyo and Bangalore, you know that's the most success we can possibly have as a business. And I think because New York is the melting pot, I, I think versus I, I love Silicon Valley. I spent a lot of my career there. Um, I think building a differentiated company in New York City with an incredibly different, diverse culture in general, I hope will end up being one of the defining things for AOL in the future. And lastly, uh, we, we talk about thinking in the next and the essential qualities of our family here at Anderson are that we share success, which you've spoken about quite a bit, think fearlessly and drive change. Uh, what do those qualities mean for you personally and for AOL? Yeah. Sharing success, thinking fearlessly, and yeah. driving change. Yeah, I think actually, you know, I think sharing success is also celebrating success with other people. When you do something really big in your life, you know, you don't call yourself. Uh, you tend to call other people. <laughs> and I think that, you know, the, the focus um, in sharing success is actually it makes your life better. Uh, and I think it makes it more enhanced uh, overall. I think taking risks, I, I just saw the uh, former uh, CEO and head of one of the large investment banks, one of the really big banks in the world, and he said something interesting to me, I'll probably remember for the rest of my life. He said, 
you know, Tim, you guys have been taking a lot of risks at AOL, and that's a strategic advantage because almost everything else in your life is meant for you not to have any risk. Um, and if you think about it, you know, uh, you know, companies have compliance departments, and you know, we deal with the SEC, and you have everybody telling you have lawyers, and everyone telling you, you know, what the, what where risk lives, and how do you avoid it in general. So if the world, and this was his perspective, the world is. 90% constantly trying to avoid risk, but you take the 10% that's not, and you make your 10% the 90%, you will end up leapfrogging in front of other people because you're willing to take risks that other people aren't willing to take. And I think, I have a personal theory on this, which is when you're young, the more risks you take seem less risky as you get uh, older. And as you get, if you haven't taken any risk as you get older, it's harder to take risks. So I, I literally I just sent a note out to this morning I mentioned earlier. Basically, the number one thing on the, on the note said, take more risk today. Well, I said to our executives, what's a risk you're going to walk around the company and take? And right before I walked in here, I got called from one of our executives. And he said, I hope it's OK. You, know, you sent that note out this morning. And I went in, and I got a group together of stuff that has been a mess. And I got them all organized. And we're going to attack this project. In general, are you OK with it? And I said, why are you calling me? You know, he said, well, I'm calling you to make sure you're okay with it. I said, didn't I just tell you? you know, I, I said, first of all, you did exactly what I wanted you to do after reading that note. And, and so I think taking risks is a strategic advantage uh, also. And then I, I think, you know, the, the, the change, uh, which we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, if you're willing to change as a person, you're going to have a great career and a great uh, life uh, overall. I think when you stop changing is when you really run into uh, issues. And if you're honest with yourself about what your skill sets are and you're honest with what people you need around you to be successful, you know, you'll have a, a very, very successful life and you won't limit yourself by your own limitations. And uh, maybe in closing, one, one of the things that I encourage our executives to read was uh, Ray Dalios, who runs Bridgewater Associates. He has a document called the Principles Document. And it's 119 pages. It's really dense uh, to read. But uh, one of the things he has in that document is, is basically the theory that you can get uh, anything you want in your life, but you can't get everything you want. And to get anything you want in your life, you have to surround yourself with the people who will allow you to reach your goals. And I think the biggest challenge I see with some executives in their careers is they have to, they want to make it all about just them and your shared success thing. If you make your career about just shared success, you'll have more fun, you'll be more successful, and uh, you won't have to run around trying to hide what your weakness areas are. No, nobody really cares. They want you to be, most people want other people to be successful uh, overall. Well, thank you so much, Tim, for inspiring us to take the leap to swing for the fences and um, uh, to, to really think in the next. And you've shown us a model of reinvention that's very rare. So thank you very thank much. You. Small Thanks token for, for UCLA Thank you. Anderson. Thank you. And